Hai, selamat sore, selamat siang, selamat malam, selamat pagi, selamat apa aja lah buat kita semua yang ada di muka bumi ini. Hari ini nggak uh, begitu banyak yang mau saya bahas, tapi ada satu yang ingin saya bahas tentang orang ini yang namanya Scott Ritter. Scott Ritter ini seorang pengamat militer uh, beka, oh, bekas kalau anda masih ingat dulu dia menjadi uh, menjadi uh, pengawas untuk uh, WMD-nya ofisernya dia waktu itu ke Irak dan ketika dia tidak mau berbohong dan dia memilih untuk tidak ikut uh, dengan kebohongan yang dikatakan oleh uh, negaranya maka dia keluar dari sana uh, sejak itu sampai hari ini dia banyak sekali melawan ketidakbenaran dan apa yang dan kebohongan-kebohongan yang terjadi nah, salah satu orang yang dari segi militer yang saya lihat yang sangat pintar dan dia banyak membela uh, yang benar salah satunya adalah peristiwa di Palestina uh, peristiwa Palestina ini dia katakan sejujur-jujurnya apa yang dia katakan sebenar-benarnya hari ini saya agak uh, melangkah sedikit agak sedikit jauh dari apa yang saya ingin saya tunjukkan tentang dia tapi hari ini saya mau menceritakan atau kita menonton bersama-sama tentang beliau di uh, apa yang dia lakukan untuk sebentar ya uh, apa yang dia lakukan untuk uh, Palestina. Beliau adalah seorang yang sangat saya kagumi dan sangat saya banggakan sebagai seorang yang bukan beragama Islam tetapi membela betul-betul membela kepentingan kebenaran dan kebenaran itu sangat susah untuk dijelaskan. Ini bukan masalah ras lagi, ini bukan masalah agama. Saya makanya saya agak kecewa dengan apa yang India lakukan hari ini terhadap uh, terhadap apa yang mereka lakukan terhadap bangsa Palestina, di mana mereka ikut-ikutan memerangi Palestina karena hanya berdasarkan satu agama saja. Ya, Dan saya meminta untuk teman-teman di Indonesia untuk meminta pertanggungjawaban. Uh, untuk pertanggungjawaban dari India itu mengapa mereka tentara mereka ikut-ikutan berperang melawan uh, Palestina jika begitu kita juga Indonesia seharusnya ikut berperang melawan mereka namun ya begitulah keadaannya sebenarnya yuk mari kita tonton bersama-sama siapa Scott Ritter dan kita dengarkan apa yang beliau ucapkan I, I mean literally I think You know, Larry. Larry said it all. Look, the the Israelis have a you know their policy is, is to commit genocide against the Palestinian civilians. Um, they have a doctrine, the Dahia doctrine, named after the West Beirut suburb that uh, they blew away in 2006 because Hezbollah kicked their butts on the battlefield. So they said, well, if we can't beat them militarily, we'll punish the civilians so much that they'll never allow Hezbollah to fight us again. <laughs> How's that working out, Israel? Um, you know, but then they implemented that repeatedly against the Palestinians. And uh, what we're seeing right now is basically Israel knows that it can't militarily defeat Hamas. I mean, I'm not on the battlefield, I, you know, uh, but I, I can just tell you that common sense dictates that when Uh, an opponent that is well prepared as Hamas was, and Larry you know, pointed out, this attack on October 7th was one of the the finest um, military raids um, you know conducted in modern history. Um, the intelligence uh, of the uh, in preparation, the training, the tactics of betul yang dia katakan. Saya seperti yang selama ini saya katakan uh, September apa Oktober uh, peristiwa yang terjadi tanggal 7 itu adalah sebuah peristiwa militer terbaik yang pernah kita alami dalam sejarah ini di mana 1200 orang mampu menghajar ya menghajar tentara Israel 
yang sangat terkenal kekuatan militernya terbukti di sini mereka ya terkentut-kentut so the Hamas were uh, i mean impeccable they had fantastic intelligence they knew what they wanted to do they know who they wanted to do it to where they needed to go they knew the timings uh and they executed it uh, then they came back the reason why they took all those people hostage was to create bait <laughs> and then you create so that israel now has to come into your battlefield now if you took all the time and effort to plan this october 7th event do you think that and you were trying to lure israel in do you think maybe that you had prepared this trap that you were anticipating what israel could do of course they did they knew that israel was going to bomb the living crap out of the above ground that's okay from hamas perspective because a you create cities of rubble that now make it impossible for Israel to operate effectively. They should have learned that from, say, Stalingrad or, you know, Monte Cassino. Um, but below ground, you have 500 kilometers of tunnels that aren't just haphazard. These tunnels have been thought out in advance. Um, majority of these tunnels don't terminate on the surface. If you take a look at the Hezbollah videos, when their guys are emerging, you'll see that they they've had to open up the thing and clear out about six to eight feet of um of 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 of, of earth to get to get out of the tunnel why because the israelis can't come in with some uh, basic you know uh ground penetrating radar and detect it and what happens here when israel clears out their berm area where their guys are sitting in the middle resting with alleged security around hamas pops up right in the middle of it <laughs> okay thank you very much bap 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 back down then they blow the tunnel so that it doesn't connect with anything hamas has prepared this battlefield for a decade they know exactly what to do there's no way this israeli conscript force larry what's the average age of an american marine major uh probably 32. yeah uh not 23 though right right yeah okay so you got these israeli majors majors (laughs) field grade officers 23. Uh, what's the average age of, say, um, I don't know, a, um, a staff sergeant? Yeah, about uh, 28, 29. But not 19. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what, what we got to understand is you have this army, this Israeli conscript army, that is putting people in command positions. Look, when I was a captain, I was a pretty good Marine. I, you know, I'm not bragging, but I was okay. I was all right. But I have to tell you, every time somebody hit me with a problem, I went... Staff Sergeant, Gunny, come in here and educate the captain, please. And the only reason why I was really good is I had really good staff NCOs who backed me up, who kept me doing the right thing, who had didn't hesitate to come in and say, uh, Skipper, you don't want to do that. Uh, no, why not? Da, 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 da. Well, yeah, you're right. I don't want to do that. And things work. Now, imagine a 19-year-old sergeant. A 19-year-old sergeant. That means he was conscripted at 18. <laughs> He's gone through a year of training and now he's a sergeant and he's going to be advising his 23 year old major about what all the experience he has all the extensive combat the israeli army is a joke it is a literal joke they're they're good at beating up 10 year old boys yeah. they're good at raping uh, girls they're good at murdering women and that's all they're good at they're not good at fighting they're really not good at fighting Russians who fought in Mariupol, fought in Bakhmut, are looking at the tactics that the Israelis are using uh, in Gaza and saying uh, they'd all die. If, if you took those Israelis and put them in Bakhmut or Mariupol, they'd all die. Now, I know that they're not fighting you know, a, a, a large uh, conventional army, but their tactics suck. They suck. And it's not just that they're bad soldiers. They're bad people. Now we come to what Larry talked about. They, The murder of those three Israelis proves that the Israeli army has to shoot to kill orders. And you know what's interesting about that? It's a war crime, a literal war, war crime. crime. You're not allowed to do this. They do it. They have a, a doctrine called the gospel, or not a doctrine, but a plan called the gospel plan, the Hasbara plan. Um, it's AI generated. They've about- broken Gaza down into you know, target packages determined by a computer that says, when you drop a bomb on here, this is how many civilians you kill. Why the hell do you need to know how many, or predict how many civilians you kill? And then you drop the bomb anyways, because your whole purpose is to kill civilians. That's what the Israelis are doing right now. 
And here's the sickest part. Joe Biden has given him a green light to kill as many Palestinians as they can up until the end of the year. And that's what's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Not because Israel thinks they can defeat Hamas. They can't. They know Hamas is going to survive this conflict. What they're trying to do is terrorize the Palestinian people so much that when this is over, the Palestinian people will never let Hamas do on October 7th again. And it's going to backfire. Dan jangan lupa loh, apa yang dikatakan Scott Ritter sangat terbukti semuanya. Dia sangat pintar dalam mengamati peristiwa-peristiwa yang terjadi di dunia sekarang. Apa yang dikatakan tentang uh, tentang Rusia, perang Rusia, perang uh, Ukraina, 100% benar semua apa yang dikatakan. Semua orang nganggap nganggap dia bodoh, enggak, dia pintar. Fire. Because the Palestinian people have rallied around Hamas like they've never rallied behind them before. If there was an election today in Palestine, Hamas would win across the board. 76% support right now. That's amazing. Um, you can't you can't destroy them militarily, politically, you've empowered them. And the Palestinian people are behind them. This has backfired like you wouldn't believe on Israel. And Israel's suffering what I call a strategic defeat right now. And if they're not careful, um, you know, the, the whole solution was always, you know, the, the, the solution, the, the school book solution was always a two-state solution. Everybody talked about two-state solution. Oslo was premised on a two-state solution. Well, Netanyahu has just admitted that he was never going to let that happen. He's been sabotaging it from, from day one. And the Israeli behavior right now No one can ever trust Israel again. Israel has destroyed its reputation. Uh, it is a disgusting, despicable, genocidal regime that will never change. The day of Yitzhak Rabin is over. He was assassinated by a Netanyahu supporter, and Israel has fundamentally changed. I think Israel has talked itself into a one-state solution, and it ain't the one that Israel thinks it, it wants to have. Because I, I honestly believe what Israel's done is guarantee that in a decade there won't be an Israel. There'll be a Palestine. Jews will be welcome to live in there, but you'll find that when the Palestinian state is created, that many of these Zionists will flee mm -hmm. because they don't want to Karena live in peace with the Palestinians. They are what I call the Brooklyn Jew class, and I don't mean that there's nothing anti-Semitic in that. Brooklyn Jews, that's it, class of people uh, who feel free to fly into Israel uh, and go to the West Bank and murder people and steal their homes and steal their land. And When confronted about it, they say, well, that's, that's what we get to do. The courts back us up, the soldiers are there. These are Americans who go to Israel to murder Palestinians and steal their land. Dan juga um, dari they aren't going to stay in Israel. They're going to try and come back to America. I'd like to believe that we pass laws that say you're not welcome back here. You're on your own. But um, it's over for Israel. I think Israel has talked itself out of existence. That's the the real implication of this of this fight. You know, if you, uh, if you went back to October 5th and you had done a survey of the Arab Muslim countries in the Middle East, <coughs> you'd find that Hamas was not very popular in Egypt. Hamas was not popular, not much support in Saudi Arabia at all. Ditto for Jordan and for Turkey. What Israel has done in the last three months is they turned Hamas into a sympathetic figure or at least one that the Egyptians, the Saudis, the Jordanians, and the Turks have to pay attention to. If, if for no other reason just to placate the, the guy in the street that's really upset by what they're seeing Israel do to the Palestinian uh, civilians. So it has actually made Hamas stronger. Sure, that's but... the irony of this. It's made Hamas stronger, not weaker. And, you know, Israel's got this in their mind, they think that they can always kill their way out of something. And mm -hmm. it's like they decided, I think it wasn't it, Netanyahu just announced that, that maybe they were going to do like Munich too. You know, in the aftermath of the Munich Olympics, they, they sent out hit teams to kill all the perpetrators. Well, you know, number one, it was basically a failure as a mission because the, they killed a waiter up in, New, in Norway who wasn't even involved, had nothing to do with it. And uh, they didn't get them all. And when the operation was over, it didn't stop the terrorist attacks. And so, I mean, the, the goal of using force is ultimately to stop the attack. You know, I, I'm a firearms trainer and I teach people, you never draw your gun and point it at someone unless your life is in imminent danger. 
And then if you have to point your gun and fire, fire, but make sure you stop the threat. Once the threat's over, got back in the holster. Well, Israel's never learned that. Uh, they've, uh, you know, the, this policy of killing civilians is, is it's going to cost them. I, I, you know, it's bad when a friend of mine, she's Jewish, she's a daughter of a Holocaust survivor. And I was at her house two nights ago. They had that sort of a holiday party. And she comes up to me and whispers, she goes, I'm watching what's going on over there. And the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians what the Nazis did to my mother. You know it's bad. Bad. When you got a Jewish lady who's a Holocaust survivor who's making that comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, if you could, and Scott, maybe I can have you come back in here, the ramifications of what Israel is doing has obviously spilled over well beyond uh, the Gaza was called an enclave of uh, that, that part of Palestinian territory. And now there is uh, increasing tensions around the Red Sea with uh, Yemen's Ansar Allah uh, getting really deep in uh, waging a blockade that's been pretty successful to this point um, in response to what's happening in Gaza. But of course there's more with Hezbollah and uh, there have been, I, I feel like there's been more and more tensions regionally, and Israel is talking about trying to get the U.S. to help them push Hezbollah back along the border. Uh, help us make sense of the regional ramifications and where this is going as we enter 2024. Well, first of all, let's reflect back on um, Nasrallah's uh, speech that he gave, I think, on October 9th, two days after. Um and I call it the escalation management speech, uh, and and because everybody's expecting Hezbollah to jump in and, and join the fight, and Hezbollah basically said, "Yeah, we're our, we're we're in, but our way. We're going to do it our way. We're not going to do it. Uh, we're not going to do it that way." Because how is Israel going to be strategically defeated here? Israel set the parameters of victory, being the destruction of Hamas. I think Larry and I agree. Hamas is won. They, they're not going to be destroyed. So Israel's already lost this war. Plus, if you're Hezbollah, your goal is the creation of a Palestinian state. So the law, you've got to keep the whole world's focus on that problem set, and it's working against Israel. The whole world is rallied behind it. The last thing you want to do is expand this conflict, because now suddenly the Palestinian issue is not the only issue. In fact, it's going to be put on the back burner as you deal with bigger regional issues like war with Iran. That's a bigger problem set than the Palestinian issue. So you don't want to expand this conflict. So you've seen a lot of escalation management, but it's been done very cleverly. Uh, Hezbollah, for not wanting to get involved, has tied down one, one half of the Israeli Navy, one third of the Israeli Air Force, one quarter of the Israeli Army. They forced 70,000 people to be displaced out of northern Israel, uh, putting a huge burden on the Israeli economy. And they're just humiliating the Israelis on a daily basis on the border. And um, the, here's the thing. You think... Hamas has tunnels. It's Hezbollah cool. has tunnels. Better tunnels. Deeper tunnels. Longer tunnels. You know that tunnel that the Israelis dug up? It's amazing. Right at the, I think it's the Eretz crossing. And suddenly, 400 meters from the crossing, how far along are we? 70 some odd days in this conflict? And they go, oh my God, the biggest tunnel imaginable that you can literally drive a car through is right here. Wait a minute. You guys didn't find that tunnel until now um that tunnel is small compared to the tunnels that hezbollah has carved into uh northern israel when the time comes hezbollah will seize northern israel there's nothing the israelis can do to stop it they will take uh kiryat shimona they will take other towns they will take the galilee israel can't stop them but hezbollah doesn't want to do that right now hezbollah has let it be known that they can do that and they will do that if called upon and this is why you're seeing Israel hesitate, because you've got all the chest-thumping guys saying, we need to go in and kick Hezbollah's butt. Israel proved that they can't kick Hezbollah's butt. They tried it in 2006. didn't work. Hezbollah has gotten even better. They've become combat-hardened uh, with uh, you know a, a, a decade-plus experience in Syria. Um, so 
has, there's nothing the United States can do. What you think American pilots and American airplanes dropping American bombs are going to do a better job than Israeli pilots and American airplanes dropping American bombs? Um, no. First of all, our pilots aren't that good anymore. We just don't train that well. Training is expensive. Um, you know, when was the last time we did a real honest to God, uh, you know, air attack against somebody with an integrated air defense or somebody has the potential of doing that? Yeah. Not in a long time. Our pilots don't know how to fight. And so we'd be going through a learning curve that'd be unreal. And then we'd get humiliated because it's not stopping anything. Um, and you think Americans, when, when Hezbollah moves into northern Israel, you think Americans are going to drop bombs on Kiryat Shimona? You think Americans are going to drop bombs on Israel? Ain't going to happen. See, Hezbollah isn't going to sit in southern Lebanon and let the fight come to them. Hezbollah is going to take the fight to northern Israel. And now the Israelis are going to have to bomb their own cities, bomb their own people. America will stay out of that fight because we are not going to bomb Israel. Hezbollah's thinking. They know this. If I know this, Israel knows this. America knows this. That's why I'm not too worried about an expansion of the fight because Israel knows they'll just get, I was going to use a bad word, they'll get beat up. Um, now we come to the Houthi. You know, this is very rude of me, uh, but every time when I, when I, when I think of the Houthi, I just think of, you know, some some wild dudes from Mad Max, you know. <laughs> you know, just yelling charge and go. Because they just sort of, on October 19th, they just appeared. The Houthi just woke up and said, screw it, launch. And everybody's like, what the heck just happened? The Houthi just fired on Israel. Did that really happen? Houthi, like, hell yeah, that happened. We're going to do it again. Launch, launch, launch. And then, then they say, screw it, take a ship. Kuri termasuk sangat kuat loh. Uh, Saudi sudah pernah mencoba menghancurkan Yemen meng- dengan menggunakan tentara Amerika, tapi mereka kalah juga, dihajar dengan oleh uh, Houthi. Fly helicopters out there, take everybody. What the hell's going on? What are the Houthi doing? And then the Houthi just say, "We're going to shut it all down." And they have. They've effectively closed the 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 the, the, the mat. Uh, I can't I can't say the word. Uh, the Man El Bab. Uh, straits, um, that little narrow piece of water between Yemen and, and Djibouti. <laughs> you know, they've shut it down. The Red Sea, you can't go to the Suez Canal right now because the Houthi have shut it down. And now America's going, what do we do? So we've, we're moving a fleet down and we're realizing we can't do anything. Now, the big news isn't that America can't beat the Houthi. I mean, we can't. Um, and we're not going to. to. To to secure those straits, we'd have to put 40,000 Marines on the ground. We don't have 40,000 Marines to put on the ground. We can't get 40,000 Marines there. And once we get them on the ground, we can't sustain it. There's 100,000 plus Houthi out there. We ain't going to beat them. Saudi Arabia has been trying since 2014 using yes. American planes with American bombs, yes. using American intelligence. Hasn't worked. The Houthi can destroy Saudi Arabia's oil production capacity. That's one big thing here that's causing everybody to hit pause on that. Saudi Arabia is like, um, you guys are going to do what to the Houthi? Pause, pause. Pause, please pause, because they're going to blow up the Aramco oil fields, and we don't want that to happen. Um, the United Arab Emirates going, wait a minute, you're going to do what? No, no, we don't want to have anything with that either. Pause, 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 because they don't want to lose their oil production capacity either. So America's sitting there going, hmm. But here's the big story. It's not about that strait. You know how America has been saying for decades, we guarantee that the Strait of Hormuz will be open? That Iran will never shut it down. That if Iran ever tries to shut down the Strait of Hormuz, the American Fifth Fleet will keep it open. That's just been proven to be a lie. Yeah. Because we yeah. can't beat the Houthi, and we damn sure aren't going to beat the Iranians. What this proves is that America's fleet, all of its you know dozen you know aircraft carrier battle groups, can't do anything. Yeah. It's, a, it's a waste of money, total waste of money. We have to be careful about getting sunk, losing a carrier. Um, as Larry said, you know, I'm an American taxpayer, okay? So I got the USS Carney out there, you know, the Aegis class, uh, you know, Arleigh Burke class uh, destroyer. It's got 90 missiles, SM2s, SM6s, other things out there. And each one of them runs between $1.1 and $4 million each, depending on which missile you use. So who do you have thousands of these drones and cheap missiles? They cost them $2,000, $5,000, Maybe ten grand for the good stuff, and the Houthi are just sitting there again. 
uh, the guy from Mad Max, no! and they're going to launch these things. And the carny is going to go detected, launch, shot, detected, launch, shot, detected. And now they're, they're done. They fired off 90. And as Larry said, they don't have the tenders anymore. You can't bring up the ship that goes resupply in, 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 in they got to pull the carny out. And then who's going to replace the carny? Some other funky named ship that's going to fire off 90 missiles and have to go and another one and go. There's only so many, you know, missile destroyers in a carrier battle group. And when they deplete this stuff, the carrier's got to go because it can't yeah. stay there. Something's going to hit the carrier. And now here's the other thing. <clears throat> what have the Ukrainians been using that's driving the Russians crazy in the Black Sea? Drone. The, uh, the, the underwater drones. The underwater drones. Well, yeah. Russia captured some of them. And I don't know if you saw it, Larry, but Russia just published photographs saying, we've just produced our own underwater drone. Hmm. And Russia yeah. has really good relationships with the Iranians. So I guarantee you that if Russia produced an underwater drone, the Iranians are producing an underwater drone. And if the Iranians produced it, the Houthi have it. And so we're going to be right. sitting there going, shoot down missiles, shoot down missiles, shoot down missiles. Holy shit, you bad word again. Got watch out. Got 20 underwater drones coming at me. It's over, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. We lost a carrier. 5,000 Americans are dead. This is the reality of the carrier battle group. It's a legacy system going back to World War II that has no application in modern warfare whatsoever. Um, America has been exposed as literally the, 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 the empty shell that we are. Well, it's all. not so much about the Red Sea. The Strait of Hormuz has just been guaranteed. We just, we just lost the Strait of Hormuz because the whole idea of the Strait of Hormuz was the perception that America could do something. Well, that's been exposed as a lie. So the Iranians are empowered. The Saudis and the UAE is going, I think it's time we have to rethink our strategic relationships here because America can't defend anything. The whole aspect of what America is doing with power projection was the potential of action that creates deterrence. We don't have the potential of action. Where can we go, Larry? Where can we go? We can't go into Europe. We've proven that. Yeah, we, right. we, we can't defend the Red Sea against the Houthi. Uh, we... We're, and we think we want to hook and jab with the Chinese in the Pacific? Are we high? America's been exposed as a nation that spends a trillion dollars a year on a military that can't do anything. Yeah. Well, and, and in fact, the, the uh, again, I had not really focused on the capability of the destroyers, their, their limited capability. I really, it had never entered my mind to explore the concept of a expeditionary Navy by a forward-based Navy. Uh, I've I made some assumptions that were completely wrong. And once you wake up to it, and, I, and again, I hadn't even thought about uh, the Strait of Hormuz until you pointed it out. You're absolutely right. You know, the, the tactic is real simple. All any country has to do is assemble 300,000 drones capable of launching uh, some sort of explosive device that can create damage on a, on a maritime vessel, and then launch them in swarms. You're either you're going to overwhelm the, the defense systems that the U.S. Navy has, and again, none of this is classified. It's all you know. It's wide open, um, and uh, then you can start sinking ships. Now, the the, the Chinese. Everything the United States is doing out there off the coast of China is just ridiculous. <laughs> and the United States is trying to pick a fight that we can't even win. We can't even finish it. So, uh, you know, one of the articles I linked to into my piece uh, was called Rebalance the Fleet Toward Being a Truly Expeditionary Navy. That was eye opening. And that was just published in September of 2023. So, what we've got is uh, the phrase I've used before, the United States has the most expensive military in the world. We've got one of the most expensive, least capable navies in the world. That's, that's the shocker. And, you, you know, Scott, what do you think, what's, why do you think they're delaying? Yeah, you know, I mean, at this point, Yemen has done everything that in normal times when we thought we had an expeditionary navy, we would have already launched. And we're not launching. Why do you think that is? Well, first of all, because, A, it, it, again, it's if, if you went in the ring with Mike Tyson, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, you're I'd, expecting I'd be out of that breath when, from running. 
<laughs> yeah, when, when he when he hits you, you you're expecting to die. So imagine yeah. Yeah. you're going in the ring with Mike Tyson, and oh God, God, and he he just lines up and he hits you, and it's nothing. You're like, what the hell? Hits you again, nothing. Yeah. You hit him, he go, he's hurt. You're like, I got this. See, America's Mike Tyson, but without the punch. Yeah. We've yeah. all hyped up. We we you know I, I likened it earlier. You know. When I played football in college, all the linemen, I was a tight end, but I was originally a wide receiver, so I was a very small tight end. Um, all the linemen, you know, go in there and they bench press, and they all got the, you know, 300-pound club, the 350-pound club, the 400-pound club in terms of their bench press. I never got above two and a quarter, so I didn't earn any of the big T-shirts. But um, but they're all out there. But it's like a guy that, uh, that in college, you know, is pumping up. He's got the 400-pound club. And now he comes back to the 10 year reunion and he's got the 400 pound club t-shirt on there and he's bringing people into the gym and he's like, everybody's expecting him to lift 400 pounds and he, he gets up to 250 and then he stops and he, and he starts talking and drinking water. You're like, well, where's 400? Can't do it anymore. That's America. Yeah. We, everybody's looking at the, expecting the 400 pound club and you got a guy that can't bitch to bench two and a quarter anymore. That's, that's America. We don't want to act because the second we act, we're exposed as a fraud and all that deterrence goes away. All the, Again, coming back to what Tony Blinken said, we have to deal with China from a position of strength. He just said that. But a position of strength means that we have to have the perception of capability. If we expose the fraud that we are with the hootie, because Larry, again, mobile relocatable targets. That's a fancy way yeah, of saying yeah. mobile missile. I, I did that around. during the Gulf War. That was my thing, hunting scuds. We didn't kill a single one. Couldn't, didn't know how to do it. And we haven't gotten any better. And so we're going to engage now in a very expensive air campaign against the Houthi, and we're not going to kill anything. They're going to keep launching. And it just exposes us as a fraud. And the whole idea of you know this potential is to intimidate the Iranians and saying, don't begin with us because you think you have mobile missiles, but we have the American name. It's very good at hunting. Oh, wait a minute. We just couldn't even deal with the hoodie. So I don't think we want to pull this trigger because the moment we pull the trigger, any pretense of American capability is gone. Yeah. The other thing is this coalition we've assembled ain't much of a coalition. Um, <laughs> it will fall apart instantaneously and then the most important thing is what happens when the hoodie take out the saudi oil fields we don't have an answer to that so i think you know we've done a lot of bluffing the smart thing for the united states at this point in time would be literally look we made a decision we're going to let the israelis kill as many palestinians as possible so the smart thing to do is just tell israel suck it up for a couple weeks um kill as many palestinians as you want to and then Come January, you got to let the humanitarian good because all the hoodie says we'll stop the moment you let humanitarian goods come into come into Gaza. Mm -hmm. Stop the killing, let the humanitarian goods in, and we will open this baby up. But what we're going to do now is empower the hoodie to come up with different terms, because now the hoodie looked around saying, "Wait a minute, we could ask for more." You know, it's like doing one of those business <laughs> negotiations, and you find out that you know you low bid and and you could have gone for more. The hoodie are finding out that. They have more leverage than they, they possibly, yeah. and they're still backed by the Iranians now who are going to be empowered. This is a game, I, I use that term all the time, it gets me in game trouble, changing. but it's a game changing, it's a game, game changing, changing thing that's going on right now. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, and look, the other day, uh, the, the Houthis, they, they shot down a Reaper drone, a $30 million ISR platform. And I... I'd, I'd love to know what they shot it down with, how much money they actually invested well, in shooting a $30 million drone. Dollar drone, but I, I'll be rolling to million. bet it was less than $500,000, which that's a pretty good return on investment. Yeah. And, you know, I think that has to also be weighing on the military planners' minds that, the, you know, it, it, as Scott noted, one, we don't have the stain power. Two, uh, when we have to pull out, it's going to make us look weak. Three, we're not even sure we can put ISR safely up in the area to find out where they're located, so we know what we're shooting. Uh, so it's a, it's not a it's not an easy task, and you know these these damn Houthis, boy, they just won't cooperate. They won't put together fixed military bases that we can easily target. <laughs> How dare they? Didn't they? Don't they know about that international based rules order? 
<laughs> They're ignoring the memo. All right, all right. Uh, with Operation uh, Prosperity Guardian, as the United States is calling it, it Scott and, and Larry, I think you're alluding to and, and directly stating this point altogether that you know the U.S. military is pretty hollowed out. It's uh, bark, no bite. But at the same time, this is quite the bark. This is a coalition of the willing. Last time that happened in this particular conflict, it was a Saudi-led U.S. from the rear coalition that did wage a pretty uh, disastrous and uh, a very uh, just a genocidal hell uh, on Yemen. That's not happening right now. And, and you're saying that it's probably not there's probably not going to be a major strike so why then even form this coalition and how how is what will happen because can it just sit and play at war like they do in the south china sea for example is is that what's going to happen i mean i i it just it does baffle my mind a bit that all of this trouble is being spent on something that has absolutely no bite well look at what they sent Canada, Canada's contribution, three staff officers. <laughs> um, Britain, they, they've sent a ship that hasn't been able to get out of dry dock. And they're really worried that it's going to break down while it's out there in the Red Sea. And they're going to be spinning around in a circle, not able to do anything. <laughs> this thing's a joke. It's a joke. Yeah, again, we just come down to, you know, I'm going to huff and I'm going to puff and I'm going to blow your house down. Um, but we can't blow anything down and we're huffing and puffing. And if, if you're going to say you have a capability, you, you should be prepared to do it. Um, you should, you know, you should be prepared to follow through. Um, the United States, I think, look, politics is a funny thing uh, too. And Biden you know, somebody may make the decision to initiate a bombing campaign just because we have to do something, but it will be disaster because we, we can't sustain. It's very expensive to bomb. I just want people to understand that, you know, sorting out the number of aircraft that we're going to have to sort out uh, with sustained sorties, um, the fuel, the, the wear and tear on the aircraft, the bombs, uh, keeping that air carrier in play, uh, shooting down all the Houthi drones are going to be coming at them. Uh, we're going to bankrupt ourselves uh, and, you know, we can't keep that 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 force in play. Hopefully, we don't lose anything. But the the real thing is that the, we're going to find out. The Houthi will find out that we're we can't beat them, um, and then the world realizes they can't beat them. This is why I think they probably won't uh, do it. But politics is strange. We are entering the really silly season of American politics right now, and Joe Biden's sort of in a desperate. You know, he's he, he lost Afghanistan. He's lost Ukraine. He's losing Israel. Um, now you got the hoodie, which means you're going to lose Iran, which means in China's watching this too. Um, basically what we're doing in Israel is in, in what we've done with Ukraine is in a very short period of time, we've gone from the world's preeminent superpower to the lapping joke. That doesn't mean we can't kill people. Of course we can kill people. We can kill a lot of people, but we can't win. And that's the thing. We can't close the deal anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Can you imagine being a Chinese intelligence analyst in uh, February of 2022, and you were asked to assess the ability of the United States to produce and supply 155 millimeter artillery shells. I suspect that that Chinese analyst or the Russian analyst for that matter would have projected a far greater capability with respect to what the United States could do. And th that would have created some caution. And now, once they've seen with their own eyes that the United States can't do it, we, we, can, we can produce maybe in one year what Ukraine would fire in one month. And so all of a sudden these countries, the, Scott, you know, it was a great analogy that we had built ourselves up like the great and powerful Wizard of Oz. And it turns out we're just a short little fat guy behind a curtain that uh, a lot of the stuff we claim we can do, we can't do. And, and then the real, the, the real sort of audacity is we've got 
uh, U.S. military planners instructing the Ukrainians on how, how to fight a peer-to-peer -peer war. Now, that that's like going to some guy to learn how to shoot a rifle, and the guy's never shot a rifle. So you don't want to take rifle shooting instruction from somebody that's never shot a rifle. And, you know, the reality is there's nobody in the world that's fought a peer-to-peer -peer battle uh, except for Russia now. <laughs> and they've got ample experience doing it. And because when you read back the, you know, one of the postmortems that the Washington Post did on why the counteroffensive failed, uh, I was stunned that in the, when they did the exercises beforehand, they did war gaming, tabletops, they left out the assumption about, well, you, you don't need fixed wing aircraft to provide close air support. And you don't need that rotary wing aircraft either that can also provide close air support as well as evacuate a wounded for the battlefield. We'll just take those out of there. Hello? I, I, you know, that's like saying, yeah, I'm going to go drive the car on the freeway only. I, I'm going to put on a blindfold, see how I do. Uh, you're going to crash. So, I mean, it's just, th this is what, th the failure of the U.S. military across the board, it's, it's not just one thing. It's a layered, uh, a layered problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. <laughs> See, we got a visitor. Um, no, it is. <laughs> and maybe to close, uh, you know, I've kept you almost for two hours now. So maybe to close, uh, any final thoughts that uh, we can begin with Scott on, uh, prospects geopolitically. 2024, where are things, where are things headed? Where is the U.S., I guess we call U.S.-NATO axis, where is it headed? And where is the rest of the world headed? Uh, what can we expect? Um, huge question, but just want to kick it to you, Scott, to, to close it and Larry, final word. Well, I think you're going to see that the United States is, I, I, you know, Larry talked about the rapid I don't I can't remember the devolution or devolution or, yeah, yeah. or of Ukraine. Um, I think we're going to see the rapid devolution of the United States. Um, you know, because it, again, how quick it, Larry brought up a wonderful analogy, the wizard of Oz. I just watched it again because, you know, it's that time of the year. Um, but you know, at the beginning, the wizard is everything. The wizard, you're off to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz. And when he, when they first see him, you go, Oh, I'm the great and powerful wizard. And, and then suddenly, the, 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 the devolution of the wizard, uh, all you had to do is have Toto come in and pull the, the, the curtain back, and you realize that all of that was fake. None of it was real. Um, Toto's done pull the curtain back. The world's seen how fake America is. Um, I don't think... I, I, we have gotten this far because we've been bad for a long time. We've been, we've been rotting from the inside, but we've gotten this far based upon reputation um, and, you know, and, and, and arrogance. And people have been buying into the bluff. The bluff's been called by the Houthi. The bluff's been called by everybody, Russia. Um, so I, I think the world is going to go through a very rapid transition. Russia's in charge of BRICS this year. This ain't going to be passive. I mean, China had BRICS, um, you know, um, and, and, and they were very good, but there was only a limited, at that time, you still believed in America's potential. I think America is going to not collapse, but we are going to be de-emphasized on the world stage. The world's tired of us. Israel broke our moral authority. Ukraine broke our, you know, our, our, our military potential. Um, you know, we're going to have to redefine ourselves, and this may take decades. But in the meantime, Russia has redefined itself. China, we haven't talked about China. China is sitting there, um, like this, this, this huge economic engine that we don't appreciate. Just like we don't appreciate the size of Russia and the potential of Russia, China's big, man. China's got a lot of capabilities. I think 2024 is going to be the year of, um, that, that America devolves. Politically, I think the 2024 election is going to be an absolute disaster and for American uh, democracy, but also geopolitically, I think the world's going to realize that America just doesn't matter anymore. And I mean, the whole world's going to realize this quickly. What happens when the, when the South Koreans and the Japanese realize that 
America's nothing. You know, suddenly all this arrogance towards North Korea is going to have to be ratcheted down. Um, so that's what I see for 2024. I see this being the year of, uh, of, of America's redefinition on a global stage, and it's not going to be redefined in a better way. This is, this is going to be a very bad year for America. Chúng ta dùng len màu trắng móc một đơn một giải. Wow, 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 wow. Sekian dulu dari pengamatan Mr. Scott Ritter yang termasuk sangat bagus dan perlu kita perhatikan buat yang kita-kita yang suka dengan Uh, yang namanya geopolitical atau war strategy kita bisa perhatikan dan belajar dari Bapak Scott Ritter terima kasih buat Scott Ritter thank you very much buat for Scott Ritter with the knowledge that he sharing us dengan pengetahuannya yang dibagi dengan kita semua semoga Palestina secepatnya from the river to the sea Palestine must be free ya terima kasih banyak Tolong di-subscribe dan di-share. Terima kasih.